Urza pointed to the void above their heads. He could see something out there. Urza, the destroyer of Dominaria, talking to the destroyer of Zalfir, Tafiri. Tafiri used a device called the Temporal Anchor to help him travel through time, but only in spirit. In order to find out how Urza activated the Silex, that had saved Dominaria from the first Phyrexian invasion, at the great cost of the plane's stability. The image of Urza had faded, and now Tafiri was alone. He walked inland from the beach he had awoken on when the Temporal Anchor failed. Where the sand gave way to coastal grass, Tafiri found a redstone arc, with depressions too worn away by time to read. Beyond it was a well-marked trail, but Tafiri could only lean against the arc. He felt tired and out of breath, like he had just run miles, his body aching. He was no longer connected to Kaya, who was communicating with his time-traveling spirit. Stranger still, he was whole, not only a spirit any longer. That meant something had happened on her end to cause this. Whatever it was, it wasn't good. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Simon, bringing you more Magic the Gathering lore. Today, we continue with the story found in Phyrexia All Will Be One. In this chapter, acting more like an epilogue to the main story, we return to a hanging plot point left over from our adventure in the Brothers War. The planeswalker who unlocked the secrets needed for the strike team to attack New Phyrexia, the Time Mage Tefiri, was last seen as a specter of time, lost in what the others perceived in a land unknown and unreachable from the outside multiverse. His spirit was sent back in time to the moment Urza activated the Silex, trying to learn how to again use the artifact to end the Phyrexian threat. However, his return to our current time was interrupted by the Phyrexian attack on Dominaria. Now we follow Tefiri in this timeless land as he uncovers a new way to fight this ancient foe, finding new allies once thought lost. Remember, if you're enjoying our content, consider supporting us by leaving this video a like, becoming a subscriber, and sharing it with your friends. Now let's continue with the All Will Be One story, Alone, by Miguel Lopez. Tefiri tried to planeswalk, but nothing happened. He tried to speed up time, but the sun didn't bend to his will. Eventually, night fell on its own accord, and Tefiri slept. He dreamt of things he wouldn't remember, but still carried with him when he wakes. He dreamt of Krug, muddy trenches filled with corpses, some fresh, some rotting, some reanimated. Then of Argoth, burning, streaked in oil, elves and humans crushed under the feet of metal beasts. He would remember some of his dreams, the cold pressure when the Phyrexians stabbed him, the dark halls of Urza's tower under siege, fire lit and chorused with agonies. His wife, Subira, didn't wander anymore. That was now his solemn duty. Tefiri awoke to see the tide had come in, though there was no moon to pull them. The landscape was illuminated in a pale blue. Tefiri had started to follow footprints leading away from the beach to a path inland. He had to find people. People must eat. People must sleep. People must laugh. All things Tefiri was desperate to find. Tefiri followed the path through a dune forest until it became a scrubland dominated by low, wide canopy trees. The sandy path gave way to packed earth, showing tracks of carts and more footprints. Tefiri bent down to use his magic to extract history from the dust. People came here once, to the beach beyond the dune forest. Parents would bring their children to spend long afternoons relaxing near the surf. Tefiri cast his mental net wider, and the visions came to him like dreams. Fishing boats lined the beach. Some of the sailors lay resting while the others headed inland to sell their catch. Making a looping gesture, he brought the past closer. Fewer families came here now. Those that did stayed close and carried weapons. No sailors took their boats to sea. They were all afraid of it. Afraid of the dark. Afraid of what they couldn't see. Another rotation, and the past became closer. Fear. Waves crashing and then horrible screams. Cataclysm. The ground reached up, lurching, moving. Another rotation, and the beach was empty. Only rain washing over the waves that rose to the dunes. Another rotation. The beach returned. The water now still as glass. Another rotation. At the end of this path, Tefiri's recall failed, and mist gave way to absolute darkness. It was a void, severed from time. It was Zafir. Nearly 400 years later, Tafiri was back in his home, the one he had phased out of time and reality, Zalfir. Tafiri followed the path until it became a cobblestone road and hid in the bushes to watch a train of wagons pass. He was tired, 
hungry, thirsty, and lost. He needed to risk trust. Tefiri emerged, greeting one of the caravanners. She screamed, and the rest cried to halt and attack. Tefiri was surrounded by spear points within a minute. Tefiri was a naked traveler. He lied and said he was attacked by bandits. One of the caravan guards passed him a cloak, assuring him they dealt with those bandits last night. The leader of the caravan looked at him solemnly, telling him that they hadn't found his party, that none had survived. Their bodies were in the last cart, as they were taking them to Kingal. Tefiri was permitted to go along and speak for them, his fallen false colleagues. The leader introduced herself as Ashe, and Tefiri lied again, introducing himself as a traitor named Sifu, though the woman thought he looked familiar. She pointed out that he had not asked about the dead, supposedly his comrades, and then questioned him how many there were. Working quickly, he scribed to pull the answer from her memory. Tefiri found reading someone's mind wrong and invasive, but there was a need. He was able to see ten dead, and that satisfied Eshe, who promised to take care of him. The next morning, the caravan halted, a day's travel from Kingal. Guards were urging the caravanners to line up. A woman beside Tefiri explained that these were the bandits that had killed their guards and took their place, and that Eshe was their leader. Eshe hushed them as she made a slow review of the bandits' prisoners. As she reached the end of the caravan, Eshe announced that there was a snake among them. She said Zalfir was at war, and had been at war for generations. First, the Mirage War, then the Keldon War, and now this long wait preparing for the Phyrexian War. She was referring to the first Phyrexian War to defend Dominaria against Yagmoth. It never came, because Tefiri had phased out the kingdom before that catastrophic event. They had all lost so many. Everyone there, bandit or caravaner, was linked in grief. She gestured toward Tefiri, saying that there was one alone who didn't suffer, and announced him by his true name. There was shouting and gasping as guards drew their swords, and when they grabbed him, Tefiri didn't resist. Ashe lifted a spear and thrust for his heart, but Tefiri commanded time to stop. Confused, her movement was still slower than time normally elapsed. Tefiri took his time to sit down and talk to her. He told her that he had loved a caravaner once, Subira, who would later become his wife. Subira listened to him when he didn't deserve to be listened to, and that they loved each other and made a family together. She grew up on the road, and didn't lose anyone when he had sent Zalfir away in an attempt to protect it from the first Phyrexian invasion. He let Subira's love absolve him from the hurt he calls Zalfir. A love like that could save a soul, but it didn't fix the mess he made. She had passed before he could find a way to fix it. He couldn't be forgiven. He could only do what was right. He had to fix this. Tefiri let time resume as normal, asking Ashe to let him go. Now, at normal speed, she told him to go away. As the caravan set off together, he walked the other direction alone. Months later, Tefiri worked as a fisherman in the river, pulling a wide net across the bank with his comrades. Labor shared, time shared. The young woman next to him introduced herself as Oyana. She already knew who Tefiri was. This work had made her strong, and she was eager to fight for her home against Phyrexia. Tefiri told her that no one was ready for Phyrexia. No one could stop them. Oyana was taken aback, moved away, and they both returned to their work. At the end of the day, Tefiri headed into the Creed Hall of the small village, a temple to the five creeds of magic. There were five guilds that served each creed for each color of magic. The Shaper Guild served blue mana. Tefiri moved towards a stone bowl in the middle of the room, stopping before the Ark of the Shaper Creed. He knelt and pressed his forehead to the edge of the bowl. The hum of mana resonated through him and thrummed up through this well and collected into the wide stone basin. Somewhere below him was a ley line. He called out for Kaya, but no answer. Tefiri was interrupted by Adia, a healer of the Civic Creed. She told him soldiers came looking for him. When Adia brought them, soldiers was a gross understatement. It was more like a war council. General Jabari walked forward, roaring a welcome to Tefiri, happy that he had found the planeswalker. Tefiri corrected him. He was just Tefiri Akosa now, not a planeswalker, apparently. The two men embraced. It had been so long since the friends had seen each other. Tefiri was back, but the sailors of their people still said there was nothing beyond the shore. Zalfir was still on its own. Tefiri began to apologize, but General Jabari stopped him. He was the Archmage of Zalfir, and Zalfir needed him, but 
Tafiri wasn't sure he could do anything. He didn't know how he'd gotten here. He shouldn't have been able to. Jabari told him that his Askari warriors only knew they were supposed to retrieve him, but Tafiri was not the only one from the outside to arrive. Jabari wanted to take him to the city of Aku, where they had a woman of regal bearing secured in amber. Before they did, the woman had asked specifically for Tafiri. Maybe it was one of his friends. Time outside this place moved differently than within it. Maybe they had fixed the temporal anchor and come to find him. Jabari described her as a young woman with white hair, wearing a golden, wide-brimmed hat. Tafiri knew who it was. The Wanderer. As they readied to leave in the morning, Ida brought him robes of the Shaper Creed, so that he would look appropriate before the Queen, even if she wanted him dead for what he had done to her kingdom. Ada expressed her fear that Zulfir would either lose the war with Phyrexia or win and become a kingdom that only knew war. Tafiri explained that some things were so big that no one could stop them. He couldn't save them all like he wanted, but he could at least stand beside them. Ada begged him to protect Zulfir. He had done it before, but before he was a different, lesser person. He assured her the kingdom wasn't just about war. They weren't bound by fate only their past. They couldn't stop what was coming, but Tafiri couldn't save Zalfir alone, but he could stand with them and help them in the aftermath. Weeks later, they arrived in Aku, the city that held the tombs of the past Zalfir royalty. The queen had come here to seek peace and spiritual guidance from her ancestors, though the amber tombs of the ancestors bristled with unsettling energy rather than peace. They walked through the corridors of Aku's main district, surrounded by patrolling Queen's Guard. They were often accompanied by someone from the Shaper Creed, or an armored cleric of the White Aligned Civil Creed. This wasn't normal. Maybe something had happened in the tombs. Tafiri and Jabari reached the Amber Tombs to find the entrance crowded with soldiers and clerics, weapons drawn. Two officers, Ascari of some high seniority, argued with each other in harsh whispers. Jabari asked what happened, and the Askari soldier told him that Karvak escaped. Karvak was a warlock who had tried to take over the kingdom of Zalfir through manipulation, eventually caught and imprisoned for his crimes. His prison had shattered, wounding General Megita, who was standing below it. The guards parted to let them travel to the central chamber of the Amber Tombs. This chamber was ancient whispering of dark magics and rituals Zulfir's ancestors risked employing to ensure those who needed to stay locked away did. The pendulum that held Karvak had fallen on the ground and shattered, its tip still embedded into the floor. Queen Wenza stood off to the side, aged only a decade since Tafiri last saw her. She declared that 360 years had passed, and that it's still Zulfir against Phyrexia. She turned to Tafiri telling him there was no punishment great enough for the acts that he had committed. If she killed Tafiri, Phyrexia would win, and that was enough to keep him alive. She addressed Jabari, telling him he was to lead the army until General Magita recovered. The queen reached into her robes, revealing a small amber bobble, and tossed it across the floor. Tafiri picked up the small prison and peered inside. It was the Wanderer, her face going from determination to confusion. The queen told him to put the prison back on the floor, and he obeyed. One of the creed leaders stepped forward whispering a spell, and the prison began to glow. It burst open. The wanderer's exhale echoed around the room. Tafiri filled her in while she recovered. She had been there for over a month, but for her, Tafiri had only disappeared days ago. The wanderer's form flickered. She was losing her hold on the plane. She warned them that New Phyrexia's invasion was upon them. Nissa was gone. Others had fallen. The Wanderer rushed to tell Tafiri about the battle at Urza's Tower, the raid on New Phyrexia, about Realmbreaker, and their desperate plan, but her voice hiccuped and stuttered. As she flickered in and out, she faded, her unstable spark pulling her away. It's not too late, Tafiri said. A fierce grin spreading across his face, the Phyrexians had awoken something that their machine minds would soon learn to fear, Tafiri, who would show them all that the sun rises in Zafir. And there you guys go, the epilogue to the Phyrexia All Will Be One story showing us the current status of Tefiri and how he will eventually rejoin the heroes in the war against Elish Norn. 
This story was really interesting for a lot of reasons. Mainly, it addresses one of the key aspects of Tefiri's character, his perceived mistake of blipping his kingdom out of time and existence. So, a little background here. Tefiri did this as the Phyrexians were starting their first invasion of Dominaria. He didn't trust his mentor, Urza, and thought that this enemy was too powerful to defeat. So rather than having his people stand bravely with Dominaria, he used his time magic to phase them from the timeline, essentially shielding them from the coming invasion. He thought he was doing right by his people, and after finding he didn't really know how to phase Zalfir back, he resigned himself to being his own people's doom, doing a better job of wiping them out than even the Phyrexians could have done. With his accident in the Temporal Anchor, it seems Tefiri has again blipped back to Zalfir and plans to bring them into the war against Phyrexia they had been preparing for, seemingly preparing for countless years now. This resolves a huge weight from this character's shoulders, a question left unanswered about Tefiri's past, as well as offers us new allies in the war against New Phyrexia with an old walker leading the fight to end an old enemy. Anyway, I'd like to know what you think about this story and its revelations. Are you excited to have both Tefiri and Zalfir back in the magic story? Let me know in the comments below. As always, I want to thank you all so much for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it, please show your support by leaving it a like, becoming a subscriber, and of course, sharing it with your friends. And until next time, guys, see ya!